Hey guys, Sam Price with University of Idaho. And this is climate on rangelands for rangeland principles or RAM 151. So quick difference between climate and weather. Climate is long-term patterns of temperature and precipitation, whereas weather is short-term variations in temperature, precipitation, wind, humidity, etc. Uh, climate can be thought of as more regional or global, whereas weather can maybe be a little bit smaller scale, more local. Not exactly, but pretty close. So jumping right into it, how does climate affect vegetation patterns? For starters, it affects plant biomass. Uh, climate, water and temperature specifically, are the main drivers of photosynthesis. If we think of our photosynthetic equation, water plus sunlight plus carbon dioxide equals energy or sugars. So the more energy we can produce, the more biomass we can produce. So more water, more light, more energy, more biomass. Um, it also affects our growing periods, you know, our number of frost-free days. Um, increased temperatures, increased number of frost-free days. It also affects that. It also affects which type of, types of plant will... Holy cow. It also affects which types of plants that will grow. Um, if we think about our different functional groups, trees versus shrubs versus forbs versus grasses, um, trees require a whole lot more water than forbs, shrubs, or grasses do. Shrubs require more water than forbs or grasses do. You know, um, our different functional groups all have different requirements when it comes to water. Um, and then when it comes to temperature, it kind of depends on physiology. Down below, I have three different examples. Um, one is a desert ecosystem, another is a tropical ecosystem, and the last is a tundra ecosystem. Um, the physiologies are the physiology of our vegetation is vastly different. Um, in our desert ecosystem, the primary driver, as far as physiology goes, is um, helping to keep that water. Whereas in our tropical systems, they have more water than they can use. So their main driver may be biomass. You know, they're just pumping water through them because there's more than enough in the soil. And then in our tundra ecosystems, you know, again, kind of like our desert ecosystems, they're more or less concerned about temperature. Um, tundra ecosystems receive a pretty decent amount of water, but the temperature regimes ten tend to constrain a lot of the biomass growth or the root growth, um, things like permafrost and whatnot. It influences soil texture and structure. Um, water can wash away materials. We have freezing and thawing cycles which break materials down. Water helps as a medium for organic acids which break down primary materials into second materials. Um, temperature influences the rate of weathering. The higher the temperatures, the faster the chemical processes that can go on. Um, and then under freezing temperatures, very little chemical weathering actually takes place. Um, but we see an increase in mecha mechanical weathering um, from freezing and thawing cycles again. Uh, the three examples I have over here to the right are uh, the first is a gel sol, the middle one is an oxisol, and the third is a molosol. So a gel sol is a tundra soil. Um, cold temperatures and permafrost 
cold temperatures and permafrost tend to um, reduce water movement through the soil. So we see a extreme reduction in chemical weathering. Uh, the result are slow subsurface soil development processes. Um, basically the only thing going on below the surface are freezing and thawing patterns. So uh, the middle one is an oxisol. So it's a tropical soil. It sees high temps and high amounts of precipitation year round. This there, there's, this therefore creates high amounts of chemical and physical weathering. Um, we see a lot of the nutrients completely removed from the soil profile, but when we compare it to the gelosol next to it, we see, um, as far as development goes, it is like much, much farther past what our gelosol is. Our gelosol is uh, a lot of maintained parent material, whereas our oxisol has been almost completely converted from parent material into secondary materials. Um, and then we move on to the mollisol, and it's a temperate soil or a prairie soil. Um, moderate temperatures and moderate amounts of precipitation. Well, moderate to low temperatures and moderate to low amounts of precipitation. Um, kind of allow soil development to occur at a faster rate than it would in a gelosol or tundra soil to the far left, but nothing like our oxisol or our tropical soil in the middle. Um, a lot of the nutrients are retained in these soils. Um, there are many other factors that differentiate these soil types from one another. Uh, climate is really only one of the five soil forming factors. Um, So big jump, ecosystems, and what are they? Um, ecosystems are generally divided into two major groups, aquatic versus terrestrial. Um, pretty simple to differentiate. One is completely covered in water, the other is not. In this class, we do not need to worry about aquatic ecosystems. I'm just kind of noting that there is a difference between the two. Um, when we start talking about terrestrial ecosystems though, they can vary drastically in makeup and size. It just kind of depends on how finely we wish to divide up these communities. Um, down below we have an example of a tropical versus a desert ecosystem, once more. Um, both vastly different ecosystems. One dry and hot, the other hot and wet. Um, the communities we see there, the plant communities that we see there, and the animal communities that we see there are vastly different from one another. But um, we can break those down even farther if we wanted to go into the desert ecosystem or into the tropical ecosystem and break those down even farther into smaller and smaller ecosystems we could. Um, the opportunity is there. You know, um, We start talking about micro ecosystems, we're looking at like stumps you know, um, or kind of uh, like gaps in an ecosystem, you know, um, small disturbances, a tree falling, um, you know, a rock slide, something like that, um, where we, we all of a sudden have a completely different type of habitat or an ecosystem within an ecosystem, you know. We can really break these ecosystems down into extremely small little bits and pieces. Um, but one way to think about ecosystems would be at the biome level, which is the absolute largest recognizable unit that we have for an ecosystem. These are very large ecosystems recognized by predominant vegetation and animal communities. Um, the organisms that inhabit these biomes are all adapted to that particular environment in one way or another. Um, so when we're talking about a biome, we're not so focused on the small, really, really small peculiarities about an ecosystem. We're more or less concerned with the large scale peculiarities, um, temperature, precipitation, you know, things like climate is what we're worried about here. 
So what do create these different biomes? Kind of like I said in the previous slide, precip and temperature seem to be the primary driving factors when we're looking at the difference between biomes. So we look at the top, the very, very top. We're looking at annual precipitation and average temperatures. We see tropical rainforest, moderate temperatures, moderate to high temperatures, extremely high annual precipitation. That's what defines that biome. Um, then we start looking down around the bottom. We're looking at subtropical deserts, temperate grassland deserts, woodlands, shrublands, temperate forests, boreal forest, tundra. If we look back and we remember what the definition of a rangeland is from like chapter one, page one, um, we remember that rangelands are deserts, shrublands, open woodlands, grasslands, tundra. Um, so this is, this is our primary focus here for this class, is this bottom kind of half of this whole um, figure that we see here. Hey, there we go. There are rangelands. Under the way of looking at this, I kind of like this figure a lot. Um, again, precip and temperature. And we're thinking about rangelands. So we're looking at the bottom third of this graph. Bottom third, bottom half. Tundras, grasslands, savannas, deserts. You know, everything basically other than possibly the tropical desert. I mean, if it were defined as a barren desert, then it would not be considered a rangeland. Because again, we're going back to one of our first PowerPoint presentations. I think it was called, What is Rangelands? And when we were talking about rangelands, we mentioned deserts, but not barren deserts. So places like the Sahara and the Kalahari would not be rangelands because they're barren. Moving on. Super fun. Hadley cell effect. Just um, another way that biomes are created around the world. Um, if we look over on the far right, we see the Hadley cell, the north and the south Hadley cell there in the middle uh, near the equator. But uh, you know, if we were to look north or south of those two Hadley cells, we see that there are kind of recognizable other recognizable cells around the world. But the Hadley cell is one of the most interesting, in my opinion. Um, it is atmospheric circulation patterns between the equator and the 30 degree latitude. So the 30 degree north and the 30 degree south latitude. Um, when we're thinking about air, a couple things to get out of the way. Warm air wants to rise, cold air tends to want to fall. So we're looking at these Hadley cells. Um, cold air, so say, let's just say, let's just focus on this North Hadley cell, and then we just have to use one direction. So we're looking at the North Hadley cell. So cold air is traveling high above the Earth. And then somewhere near the 30 degree North latitude, it drops and begins heading south. As it heads south, it warms and it acquires moisture. Then somewhere near the equator, it begins to rise and cool. And as it cools, the moisture that it collected as it was traveling along the surface of the earth between the 30 degree and the equator, as it rises, it cools and all that moisture condenses and it rains. It then circulates back high above the surface of the earth where it again drops and heads south and acquires more moisture and warms. Um, so now real quick, shoot over to the left, the bottom left. We're looking at this picture of Africa. So the Sahara is that strip of 
Japan, in the northern part of Africa. And the Namib and the Kalahari are that strip of tan down in the southern portion of Africa. So these two areas, so the north, nah, maybe somewhere in the middle, but the northern end of the Sahara is about the 30 degree latitude, more or less. And a little past the southern tip of Africa where the Namib and the Kalahari are is the 30 degree north, 30 degree south latitude. So we're looking over at our Hadley cell and how water moves from there we see that the air drops down at the 30 degree. So the top of the Sahara and the bottom of the Kalahari. And then it moves along both deserted regions. So say we're just talking about the, the Sahara. So the water would, the air, the cold air would drop down around the top of the Sahara. And as it was dropping, it would warm. And it would begin heading south as soon as it hit the surface. As it's traveling along the surface, surface, it's acquiring moisture. It's picking up every little bit of moisture from the ground. So we kind of see now we're looking at a big barren desert. Why is it a barren desert? Well, all the moisture is being sucked out of it by this, this cold, dry air that's moving across it. So as it moves along the surface, it begins to warm. It's picking up all this heat from the surface as, long, as well as all this moisture. Then it gets to about the 30 degree, or sorry, not the 30 degree. It gets to about the equator. So now we're looking at like the Congo. So this whole middle forested region of Africa, not the whole thing, but part of it is the Congo. So one of the largest tropical rainforests in the world. So this cold, air that has dropped and traveled along the surface of the earth, picking up all of the moisture and all the heat, um, gets to the equator, gets to the Congo basically, and it says, you know what, I'm warm enough and I'm wet enough, I want to rise up into the atmosphere. So basically what this air does is it, just, it, it starts to climb, it starts to climb up into the atmosphere. As it climbs, it cools and it condenses and we see heavy amounts of precipitation in the middle of Africa. The air does the exact same thing, just in the opposite direction for, this, for the Kalahari and the Nabib deserts down in the southern part of Africa. Namib, sorry. Um, they come down at the 30 degree south latitude. They move north along the surface of the earth, picking up moisture and heat. And then when they get to about the equator, they begin to rise and cool, and then they release all that moisture. So that's how come we're seeing these mass rainforests near the equator is primarily due to the Hadley cell effect. Um, we can see that this is basically how most of these cells move across the earth, but um, in very different ways. And um, not quite as pronounced as the Hadley cell. So here we're looking at continental land effects. Um, lands around large bodies of water tend to have climates with milder temperatures or less variable temperatures. And um, I guess we can start looking at precipitation as well. Um, let's stay with temperature for a second. Lands around large bodies of water tend to have climates with milder temperatures. Um, this is largely due to water having a high specific heat. Um, it doesn't lose heat or gain heat very easily, so it tends to maintain a relatively constant temperature and it kind of acts as a heat sink. So in the winter time, the ocean or a large body of water, such as the Great Lakes or something, would be a, a source for a heat sink. You know, the land would pull energy from the water in that situation. And in the summer times, when we have these extreme temperatures, again, the ocean would act as a heat sink. So the ocean would be stealing, water, stealing temperature from the land.
Um, this is what creates this kind of even and less variable temperature that we see in a lot of our coastal climates. Um, as we move inland and we lose that effect, we begin to see more variable temperatures. Um, I guess you could say more variable amounts of precipitation, overall probably less precipitation. You know, um, as that water moves, say, east from the west coast, um, it has to move over numerous mountain mountain um, chains. Uh, you see a dramatic loss in pre the amount of precipitation um, before it really hits anything east of the Rockies. Um, from the east side, as it moves west, um, the mountains aren't as dramatic. There's a slightly less loss of moisture as those um, air currents move west. We see that uh, amount of precipitation kind of drag out for a little bit longer, but eventually it does end somewhere in about the middle of the United States. Um, you know, and we can apply this to every country in the world. Um, where is it in conjunction to a large water body? Which way do the winds tend to move? What do the winds have in the way? Um, how is that going to affect moisture? How is that going to affect temperature? Anyways. So kind of one of the things I was hinting at earlier is like the topographic effects of mountains. Um, so I don't know where you're at. I am here in Moscow at the University of Idaho. Um, so when I think of the topographic effect, I think of the Cascade Mountains, which are far west of me. But as that, as that air comes in off of the ocean, it hits Portland or it hits Seattle or it hits anything on the west side of the Cascades. And you see a lot of rain because as it moves up those cascades, those clouds just dump. And then those clouds work their way up and up and up and up, and then they work their way over the cascades, and by the time that they're up and over the top of the cascades, they're about out of water. So kind of like we were talking about with the Hadley cell, we see this air that is forced up, but this time, by a mountain. We see this warm, moist air being forced upwards by a mountain. And as it's forced upwards, it's cooling and condensing and we're seeing precipitation. The water then reaches the other side of the mountain and drops. And as it drops, it warms and it absorbs moisture. That's how come we see so here, west of Moscow, Idaho, we see the, easy, the west side of the Cascades is extremely wet. Um, and then the east side of the Cascades is extremely dry, all the way until about the Rocky Mountains, which we are just on the edge of, where we see an increase in moisture again. But that's because cold air has been forced down on the other side of the Cascade Mountains, runs east along the surface of the earth, picks up moisture, picks up temperature, and then it runs into the Rocky Mountains and is forced upwards again, where it cools and condenses. So these are some ranges of the world. This is an example that was created by Ava Strand and Karen Lanchba of the University of Idaho, as well as as well as Christopher Bernal. Um, hopefully, we remember our definition of a rangeland from the um, what our rangelands lecture that we had at the beginning of the year. Rangelands are shrublands, grasslands, deserts, woodlands, and open forests. Uh, so if we're looking at this figure, um, it would appear that the color gray would indicate not rangeland. And then 
if we also look down, so we're looking at the bottom left hand where the key is for this map, um, barren lands appear to be, be this like pinkish, tannish color. Um, so if we, again, look back to our What is Rangeland's presentation, um, barren land was not considered Rangeland. So when we're looking at this map, we're looking at everything but the gray and then the barren land. Those would not be considered rangelands. So looking at main, mean annual precipitation again. Um, when we're trying to divide up ecosystems or classify ecosystems you know one of the primary drivers we're looking at is climate what is the climate like you know if the climates are vastly different we expect there to be vastly different animal and vegetation communities um, so this is mean annual precipitation we're looking at um, the United States we can see straight down the middle there's a pretty clear cut um, separation between the east and the west. Um, east, we see relatively high amounts of precipitation across the entire eastern United States. West, we see extremely, extremely, extremely high amounts of precipitation, especially on the west side of the Cascades. As we move past the Cascades, we see very, very dry conditions, especially down into the Southwest. We see extremely dry conditions. Um, and then we run into the Rocky Mountains and we see a slight increase in precipitation, but overall the entire American West is relatively dry. Um, if we think back to the topographic effects or the orographic effects that we were talking about earlier, um, as that air from the ocean comes onto the continent and tries to move east, it hits the Cascades where we see an extreme um, dump of precipitation. It keeps moving eastward. It hits the Sierras. We see another dump. It hits the Rocky Mountains. We see another dump. By time it heads east of the Rocky Mountains, that air is basically completely and entirely out of moisture. There's no moisture left in that air. Um, so it hits these Midwestern regions and it is just picking up temperature and picking up moisture as it drags along the surface and heads eastward. Um, another way to look at climate zones. Uh, one of the, I assume that this is looking at climate from both the temperature and precipitation. Um, we see on the east coast as we move north our climate zones vary whereas in the previous slide basically the entire east coast was one climate zone. Um, the west we have multiple varying climate zones and that could be largely due to temperatures we see this strip of purple highland alpine climate so that would be due to topography um, as we increase in elevation we see a decrease in temperature increase in precipitation so that's what's going on there so i mean this whole model could be temperature precipitation and elevation um, there are multiple ways to model climate. Um, I like kind of like ecosystems earlier, it just depends on how finely we want to uh, divide these categories. So, we're going to start talking about challenges in managing rangelands. Um, and one of the main challenges to managing rangelands would be year-to-year -year variation in precipitation. Uh, variation from year to year is great. 
and we're looking at this um, figure down below and we're seeing that not only is it variable but the bulk of our precipitation is falling far outside of our growing period or our effective precipitation zone um, which would be April to June you know when the plants need it we need it um, we want it now but it's not there bummer so this whole figure was actually taken from a study 50 years of change in said shad scale stand in Idaho um, Lee A sharp Ken Sanders and Neil Rimbley um, basically there's a site in southern Idaho that they've been following and charting and taking data from um, beginning back in 1951 and these photos have been taken annually these photos and these measurements have been taken annually since 1955 um, what I have following this are selected photos um, just to show the dynamic nature of this site So we see back in 1951 when the study started, we have um, a relatively moderate year with a relatively moderate amount of um, April to June precipitation. Again, April to June is kind of our effective precipitation zone. Um, that's the water that the plants need right now. So. 1951 we're looking at kind of moderate amounts of both effective precipitation and annual precipitation we jump to 1955 we're looking at these values and they're not much different from the values that we saw on the previous slide from 1951 moderate amounts of effective precipitation and moderate amounts of annual precipitation but if we look back at 1954 we see that 1954 was an extremely dry overall year as far as far as annual precipitation goes so this is an, an average amount of effective and annual precipitation but following an extremely dry year um, we're looking out there and we're comparing it to the previous photo we can see that our shrub biomass is way down perennial grasses way down overall biomass is way down jump forward to 1958 a couple more pretty hard years looks like 1957 was pretty decent but 1958 was not um pretty pretty average annual precipitation but relatively low um, effective precipitation um, we see an even farther reduction in biomass from our perennial grasses and shrubs hey what's that 1963 um, 1962 was a really um, decent year it wasn't like the best year but it was a really decent year um, and then in 1963 we see a great increase from our previous photos and as far as annual and effective precipitation goes um, we're starting to see our I'm seeing a lot of perennial forbs, a lot of perennial shrubs, and a lot of perennial grasses coming back and looking extremely healthy in this photo. Oh, the 1964, the next year. So 1963 wasn't good enough. 1964 had to be better. 1964 looks amazing. Um, precip, both annual and effective, go above. What they were in 1963 so we see back-to-back -back really good years for this community um, perennial forbs are booming perennial shrubs are getting after it perennial grasses um, I'm looking here um, most of these grasses in the foreground appear to be 
bottle brush squirrel tail and they're just going off the forb looks like um it's Feralcia monrona possibly uh which is just a globe mallow but yeah we see a really healthy perennial community here and then we jump all the way to 2005 so that's a big jump um a lot of variation in the years between 1964 and 2005. Um, but what we're looking at now is a completely transformed community. Those beautiful forbs and those beautiful perennial grasses that we were looking at earlier are gone now, or at least they appear to be gone. Um, I'm seeing cheatgrass and uh, tumble mustard. Who knows what else in there, but I mean that yellow flower is some sort of mustard. And that red is cheatgrass. So we see a complete conversion from those beautiful perennials that we had back in 1964 to a complete takeover by annual forbs and grasses. Um, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, this year, this extreme amount of year-to-year -year variation, we never know what we're going to get the next year. Um, So I guess the question that I would ask is how would you manage for this? You know, this is the difficulty that we were talking about four or five slides ago. What is the main major difficulty in managing rangelands? Well, one of the major difficulties is the extreme variation in precipitation. Here we have extreme variation in precipitation over numerous years. We see a complete transformation of a healthy community into a non-healthy community. How would we manage maybe back in 1964 to keep this community healthy? Um, fire might be some of your answers. Um, you know, I'm looking out here at this community. I'm seeing a complete takeover by perennials, or not perennials. I'm seeing a complete takeover by annuals um, and very few shrubs. I know that if I set fire to this field, I'll completely lose all of my shrubs. I'll lose every perennial shrub on this site. Um, if we think back to our physiology or our habitat lectures, we know that the growing points on these shrubs are on the outer parts of the shrub. They don't handle fire the same way the perennial grasses do because their growing point is below the soil is below the surface of the soil. So if I set fire to this pasture, sorry, not this pasture, but this site, in order to remove all of these annuals, I could lose all of my perennial shrubs and possibly my perennial grasses that are still present. Who knows? Um, I could come in and graze it. But how much value do I really have on this site? Um, these mustards could be considered somewhat toxic. There are some compounds found within these mustards that are not good for, you know, um, cows to be eating. Cheatgrass. Cheatgrass gets in their gums and causes cankers and abscesses so I mean I mean that's when it's later in its development you know I would have to get cows on it extremely early but still I still have a very very short period of time to graze these annual these annual plants that I have here and say I put cattle or something out too late onto this pasture sorry I keep calling it pasture Say I put cattle out onto this chunk of range too late, then they would probably just target the perennial grasses that I have left. The perennials will be one of the few things that are probably still green later in the season. Um, the cheatgrass, all of our other annual grasses will be completely dried up by then. Nothing will want to eat them. So what would be the answer? What is the answer? I don't know what the answer is. Maybe Karen knows what the answer is, but I don't know what the answer is. So fast forward, 2013. Guess what? Cold, dry winter took a toll on the cheatgrass and the mustard. The site looks a whole lot like it did in the past. 
we see a lot of shrubs, not so many perennial grasses, but they're still there, which is interesting. I mean, you look back at the 2005 photo, you couldn't hardly tell there was anything there but cheatgrass, you know. One bad year for the cheatgrass, you know. We're looking at 1.5 effective precipitation, 8.3 annual precipitation, so far below the average. Um, and it just wiped out. It just wiped out those those annuals, those aggressive annuals, you know. Um, it's because these perennials here have taken the time and they've sunk their roots deep into this system. You know, these perennials are able to access nutrients that these annuals just aren't. So when we see these seasons where the amount of precipitation is high, you know, the amount of resources are high in these systems, we see these annuals kind of explode out of nowhere, you know? Um, they're accessing all of those resources in the soil, the shallow surfaces of the soil. Um, as soon as those resources are gone, though, those annuals are gone, um, these perennials come back strong, you know, because they aren't necessarily accessing these shallow soil horizons for nutrients, you know. They've got these root structures that go extremely deep into the subsoil surfaces. So, but it's interesting to think about. You know, back in 2005, we might have been just freaking out freaking out, trying to figure out what to do with all these annuals. We bounce forward eight years, and these annuals are completely gone with zero management. Nobody did anything to these perennials. Nobody did anything to these annuals. Just a cold, dry winter took them. Cold, dry winter and a lack of resources removed all the annuals from the site. It's very interesting. So we'll look at well we'll start to, we'll we'll think about this we'll keep this in mind from here on out you know we're thinking of the American West and our climatic reason regions that relate to vegetation patterns you know we have our two kind of primary mountain ranges that we can think of off the top of our heads you know on the far west we have our Sierra Nevadas and the Cascades in the north. And then as we move east, we see the Rocky Mountains, you know, and in between the Rocky Mountains, we have the Pacific Northwest, the Great Basin, and the Southwestern Deserts. East of the Rocky Mountains, we see the Great Plains. West of the Cascades and the Sierras, we see the Mediterranean shrub kind of um, desert regions. Um, These regions all have different precipitation and temperature cycles. They all have different vegetation and animal communities. That's how we break them up into separate ecosystems. I mean, they are all range in the ecosystem. You can break them down even farther and do separate range in the ecosystems. Great Basin, Southwest Desert, Pacific Northwest, Mediterranean, Great Plain. Just another way to kind of break these regions down into classifications um, or biomes. Uh, we're looking at deserts and semi-deserts, Mediterranean shrub, grasslands and savannas, basically. 